1170 U, Psychological Foundations and Digital Technologies, Module 10, Video 10.2. Today we'll be looking at embodied learning and technology. Here are the guiding questions for today. What do we mean by embodied learning? Has technology affected our ability to listen to our body's messages? Has the increased pace of our lives resulted in devaluing of embodied knowledge in favor of technical expertise? Embodied learning has been defined in many ways, and as a teacher of physical and health education myself, it's a really important part of how I learn. Embodied learning refers to the whole person in mind, body, and spirit. They are all taken into account, and it's a very holistic approach. Our Western heritage seems to have defined learning as a mental process that takes place in the mind. However, if you think back to Gardner's multiple intelligences, we're moving forward in terms of how we see different ways of knowing. Kinesthetic intelligence would refer to embodied learning, and that's one of Gardner's multiple intelligences. Because of Western science's focus of learning as a mechanistic process to produce responses to stimuli or process information, you might remember that from behaviorism and classical conditioning, um, and to construct knowledge through reflection on experience, we tend to ignore the messages that we get from our own bodies. Just do a quick check for your own body now. Are you stiff sitting at your computer? Have you been working too hard? Did you eat properly, sleep properly today, or get enough exercise? The focus on the mind versus the body goes back to before 17th century learning to Descartes, who was a philosopher that stated that the mind is separate from the body. This was reinforced by 18th century Enlightenment philosophers who believed that knowledge could be obtained through reason alone, thinking about things, and other sources of knowledge at that time, such as faith, tradition, or authority, were rejected by many. As a result of these Cartesian and Enlightenment ideologies, learning has become equated with mental processes knowing through thinking and cognition. It's not superficial when we uh, bring the uh, video and clips from Ferocious Beauty Genome into the classroom. You know, you might imagine that it would be fun to bring in music and fun to bring in video clips, but it's much more than that. By encouraging our students to embody a process, it causes them, I think, to think much more deeply about that process and to really imagine the mechanics, the rules that are driving why that process um, happens as it does. When we embody we're getting into the habit of thinking more deeply about that process. And that's a habit, a skill that's really worth building. And so I think they've activated their imaginations in incredible ways. And I'm not even sure they know how much they've activated their imagination. And one of the ways we started to notice it is because they would meet with us and have all these ideas about how the dance was supposed to go. Well, you could do this, you could do this, make the dancers do this because, and you realize that they are translating something that they're seeing in this universe of the mind and this imagination, they are translating it. So uh, embodied learning, causes us to think in different ways about a topic. So we began to experiment a lot with a direct translation of what we think the biological process is into our bodies. And this is when we began to see that what an incredible teaching tool this could be. Because when you embody the process, you start to realize what you don't understand. And in the best sense, you ask questions. You ask questions because you want to get the movement right. And those questions are fantastic. So the phrase that uh, teachers use is differentiated learning. And um, there are different ways of learning. And if we can uh, bring students into our fields, into our topics using different approaches, I think that can be very powerful. Let's go back to thinking about our body's messages. Martha Graham, the founder of modern dance, and historically well known for the, being the creator of modern dance, said that the body doesn't lie, and I think that's very true. Rejection of the body's messages is far more common in our culture, though. We reject the body and we privilege cognitive or logical rational thought. We don't listen to our body's message of hunger because we want to look a certain way. We don't listen to our body's message of fatigue because we want to achieve more at work. 
We don't listen to our body's message of pain because we want to mask it and go forward. And we don't listen to our body's messages to slow down because we live in a culture of speed and instant gratification. The body is a perpetual reminder of our mortality. But ironically, children and animals have a deep-rooted instinct to listen to their bodies and self-preservation is important. So if they're hurt or injured, they stop using the injured part. If they're hungry, they eat and don't overeat. And if they're tired, they just sit down and rest. Wouldn't it be great if we could do that all as adults? How do you think our culture is teaching us to ignore, devalue, and override the learning and wisdom of our own bodies? Is exposure to technology a part of this? Because if you think about it, our bodies are pretty amazing technical machines. We live in a very body-centric culture, but we live inside our own bodies, and we learn about who we are through our body's messages, their abilities or disabilities, their strengths or weaknesses, and we tend to define ourselves by our physical representations. How difficult is it to define our adult self as something more than our body? It's very difficult for many people. Popular culture reflects a growing interest in reconnecting us with our bodies, but not their actual lessons. In other words, we're flooded with information about how to improve or change our bodies, to quit smoking or lose weight, or generally improve how we look, but not to accept them for the miraculous technological machines that they are. I really want you to reflect on that so we can chat about that in tutorial. Let's think about the mind and body. Time and Newsweek have re fairly recently written about the new science of mind and body because the relationship between emotions and health that we studied in our module on emotion, stress and health is well documented and very interesting. Benson, Corliss and Cowley state Viewed through the lens of 21st century science, anxiety, alienation, and hopelessness are not just feelings. Neither are love, serenity, and optimism. All physiological states affect our health just as clearly as obesity or physical fitness. The challenge is to map the pathways linking mental states to medical ones. Well, how can we reclaim our body in learning and start to listen to how the ways that it can help us in our learning journey? First of all, we need to know that embodied learning is linked to experiential learning. Somatic, or body knowing, is connected to adult learning through the ways that we make meaning of our experience. Learning in the experience and moment is a felt reaction, and when you feel something, whether it's an emotion or a physical reaction, your body will physically respond. A pain in the neck, sick to your stomach, nerves, these are all physical reactions that we feel. We also have the power of embodied action in how we represent people and how we dress. For example, having medical residents wear lab coats, they sort of become doctors. Or having models wear a certain type of clothing, then we know they're models. So we really dress our bodies in ways to represent who we are. Can you think of some other examples of that? I was young I don't think it hit me that I I loved the sport um, but my parents saw that I always had a ball at my feet just attached to me and then you know it finally dawned on me around the 1999 Women's World Cup that there's a future in this sport and that's when it sort of hit me that that's what I wanted to do. You know we've got three months to really put things right and it's 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 that you know that last summit on Everest, you know, you're looking to try and get that flag down. There will not be many teams in the world that will have a, a cohesive training program where you can micromanage every aspect of the international players' development. John and his coaching staff really brought in the, the scientific side of the sport and, you know, every practice, every game, we're wearing GPS monitors, heart rate monitors, just to measure your workload, whether you're working too hard or not enough. There you are, Sink. Well done. So I just want to say that your movement's decent, because I know it's frustrating there. Like you've done all that work, and it's... But well, if, if we had the video on that, you'd see three times where it should have gone straight into the curtain, you're turning off. The ultimate goal for London is to, to bring home a medal, and I think on any given day we can beat any team in the world, but we've got a lot of work to do. We can't expect to just put it together in the Olympics, you know, it, the work needs to be done now. 
I'm, I'm not a rah-rah person. I, I do my talking on the field and in practice, you know. I, I hope my teammates know that they can rely on me and that I will give absolutely everything. I tend to lead by example. Christine loves the captain's armband. She's a, a new leader. I get ideas from her, how she moves and how she affects the play. She absolutely loves the game and it's her enthusiasm that's really infectious. You know, when I was growing up, there weren't female soccer players to look up to or female athletes in general to look up to that were well known. You think of all the young girls that are in Canada playing soccer that dream of doing what we're doing. To get to go to the Olympics and represent your country on the biggest stage, it's just the hugest honor. One, two, three, yeah, yeah! My name's Christine Sinclair, and I'll be representing Canada in London. There are many dimensions of bodily knowledge, and Aman has stated there are four dimensions of somatic or bodily knowing. Kinesthetic, sensory, affective or emotional, and spiritual. Could you identify which of these, if any, applies to your learning style experience, and give an example? Which one of them is strongest for you? I think for me it's kinesthetic and spiritual, although affective is a big one as well. And sensory, well, I can't sit on my computer too long before having to get up. So I think they're all pretty important to me. Let's take a look at these in more detail. Kinesthetic knowing yields movement and action. It's a solving problems, developing your personal power. It, it suggests diligence and resilience and discipline and pushing on through things. Whereas sensory knowing is how we access sensations through our bodies, how we would know emotions such as nervousness. And affective knowing has the strongest emotional dimension, the power of our feelings, where our learning is grounded in feeling. Remember back to the video on memory where we said that memories are most strong when associated with a powerful emotion, such as an important life event. The amygdala, part of your brain that is part of your body, controls how strong that emotional reaction is. And that means we know what fear and anger are based on our body's reaction. And finally, spiritual knowing where we're discovering meaning, it's very soulful, we use symbols and rituals, and we each have our own way of having that sense of spirituality in our own selves. Let's reflect on how the digital world either enhances or detracts from each of these ways of knowing ourselves. What about technology versus the body? Knowing through our own bodies seems to be more fundamental than what we know through our culture. In fact, some of the messages that we receive from our culture about the way our bodies are supposed to look, about the relative value of health versus work, about the pace of our lives and our priorities, can determine how well we are ready to learn. Somatic knowledge is received from within the human being, and cultural knowledge is received from without the human being. So your body might tell you one thing, while the culture is telling you something again. That's not just your social culture, but your work culture. Can you identify some areas of your life or general cultural trends where this creates a big conflict? Here are the synthesis questions for today. Reflect on the two or three major insights that you've gained from this video and be prepared to share your thoughts in tutorial. Is there a role for somatic or embodied knowledge, somatic learning in your journey? Do you listen to your body? Why or why not? That's a big question. Has online learning affected your experience versus a face-to-face -face learning? What supports or barriers do you have in your own life to listen and trust your embodied knowledge? Do you think technology is a driving force in shaping our physical health and is it a positive force or a negative one? And thinking back to the gender issue, are there different gender messages about the importance of embodied knowledge that women are supposed to be this way and men are supposed to be another way? I look forward to an interesting discussion and tutorial.